Man, isn't it amazing, though, how sometimes, even in the midst of worship, life can fall apart? You ever had that happen? Shake your head, no, I dare you. Because you're going to have a horrible afternoon. <laughs> isn't that how life works? It is. It is. Um, that in the midst of something like this, that all of a sudden life can fall apart. And somehow in the midst of this, Faith is supposed to matter. Mm. The question I've been asking myself in preparation for this is, what is faith? I know that seems like a a foolish question, a stupid question even. What is faith? Um, Because we all think we know, don't we? We say it a lot. Well, you you just have to have faith. You just just have faith. What What does that mean? Does that mean I... Believe something I don't? I can't believe something I don't believe. (laughs) And I can't talk myself into it. What is faith? Well, sometimes we make it sound like faith is a a good feeling. Well, just have faith. You'll feel it, right? I I always call it the George Michael kind of faith. (laughs) Oh, buddy, because you got to have faith. Yeah, you got to have faith. Because you got to have faith, the faith, the faith, right? <laughs> Baby! Anyway, sorry. Good song. Um, <laughs> right. I mean, squirrel. Dana's like, squirrel! Um, uh, squirrel! I got caught up in the moment. Faith, right? George Michael seems to know what faith is, and I don't. And it seems like we're in two different worlds. And I mean that literally right now, um, uh, right? It seems like we're living in two different worlds. He seems to know what faith is. I'm not so sure. What is faith? Is it a feeling? Is it a belief system? Convince me of something. What is faith? So today we're going to explore that. This is what Hebrews is about. In order to explore that, I'm going to tell a story I think some of you have heard because it's a famous, a semi-famous uh, story. Um, it's certainly, it's used with preachers across the globe. So I'm going to follow suit. I'm going to use it. It's a good story. It's about, it's about a man by the name of Charles Blondin. Charles Blondin was actually a French tightrope walker. Um, I, somehow the French in tights, right, they kind of invented tights, and so they, they did it on ropes, too. Um, uh, he's a French tightrope walker who had an aspiration of coming to the United States and taking one of his ropes, I'm assuming a specialized rope, and stringing it from the American side of the Niagara Falls to the Canadian side and then walking across. Ah, does the name story ring the bell now he did that he got permission from the authorities he came over and he suspended that rope across niagara falls and um, of course a crowd formed and you know the way crowds form in situations like this they're not forming because they think he's going to make it they're forming on the chance that he won't the same reason you watch nascar you're waiting for the crash I know it. We all are. And, and, and if there had been a big bridge from America to, uh, from the United States to Canada, and Charles Blondin came over from France to walk across the bridge, no one would have cared, right? So they were watching for the spectacle. And he gets on the rope and he walks across. And the crowds applaud. And he comes back and the crowds applaud step by step foot by foot, inch by inch. And at this point, the crowds are into it. Can you imagine being there? Like OSHA has got to be flipping a lid right now, just thinking of the story. Um, And so so you're watching all of this, and he's playing the crowd. He's a showman. He knows what he's doing. He says, how many of you think I can push a wheelbarrow across this rope from the United States to Canada? And of course, everybody was like, absolutely. I don't, whether they believed him or not was beside the point. They wanted to see him do it or fail doing it. So they said, absolutely, and he, he plays it up. He pulls the wheelbarrow out. He was prepared, and uh, he says, I, I'll do you one better. How about how many of you think I can push this across with a load full of rocks? They're like, yes, 
Crowd's going nuts. He says, okay, fill it with rocks. So the crowd comes and they put rocks in there, hundreds of pounds worth of rocks. And he gets on that rope. He bounces, he feels it, and he begins to push, feels how that load is going to set, right? Um, and uh, yeah, foot by foot, step by step, he goes across, gets to Canada, turns around, and comes back. That's what you're supposed to do when you get to Canada. <laughs> Turn around and come back. Right, so he gets there, he turns around, he comes back, the crowds are going nuts, of course. They've just seen this twice. And he's playing the crowd, and he says, okay, now, now, how many of you that have seen this, you've seen what I'm able to do, how many of you believe I can push this wheelbarrow across with a person sitting in it? And of course, the crowd is like, we believe, <laughs> yes, please, let's see this. We believe, we have confidence in you. We believe in you. And he says, okay, who's my first volunteer? And on that day in 1859, no one rode the wheelbarrow across Niagara Falls. What is faith? Faith is not how we feel. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the confidence of things not seen. Assurance, how do you have assurance in things that are hoped for? Well, some of that is by witnessing what has already been done. You see, faith isn't just blind belief. Faith has a level of confidence. When we say we have faith in God, it's because we've seen what God does. But there is that moment of something unseen when God says, okay, who's along for the ride or who's just talking about it? There is a point where by faith we have to get in the wheelbarrow. So there's a story and it introduces well for us the book of Hebrews. Because this is what Hebrews about, is about. Um, life has gotten hard. We don't know who the author of Hebrews is. Some have speculated Paul. I don't think it sounds like Paul, personally. Some have said Barnabas. Others have said Priscilla. I like that one, as in Priscilla and Aquila. Um, uh, Priscilla, uh, the woman pastor of a home church. Right? I, I like that idea. We don't know. The fact is, is we just don't know who the author is. And more than that, we don't know who the audience is. Who was the author addressing? We don't know who specifically, like Paul would say, you know, to the church in Colossae, to the church in Galatia, uh, to the church in Corinth, or whomever, to uh, Philemon, or whoever it was. There's no way to indicate who this letter was to. Yet, something in the letter talks to us in a way that tells us the circumstances of the audience. Life was getting hard. Some of the people that the author of Hebrews was writing to are thinking about walking away from it. I'm not even sure what that means. But you know that point where you get so over all of it, you just want to throw up your hands and say, I'm done. Right? You get some of that indication in reading the book of Hebrews. And so the author begins in these latter portions of the book by reminding the people that he or she is writing to who they are. Remember who you are. Here's what it says in 1039, not a verse we read earlier, but I want you to hear this. He says, remember who you are. Here's what he says, but we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed. Instead, we are those who have faith and preserve their souls. Remember who you are. This is what he's setting up right before he gets into chapter 11, what we read earlier, or portions that we read earlier. That portion of scripture we call the hall of faith rather than the hall of fame because by faith these people were commended. So he says before we get into this and we start talking about what faith is, remember who you are. You are not the person who shrinks back and is destroyed. You don't shy away. You don't give up. He's, he's asking them to remember the same way we talk to our kids. You ever had this conversation with your kid? Whatever stage they're in, life has gotten hard. 
Maybe it's school. Maybe it's uh, for those of you with um, with married kids, or maybe it's marriage um, uh, that their marriages are hard. Maybe uh, maybe they're sick. Maybe uh, maybe uh, school isn't going the way that it should. Maybe the friends are not treating them the way that they had anticipated. But our kids come to us. Life is hard, and they have that moment of despair, panic, whatever it is. You say to them, uh, "Don't you quit." Don't forget who you are. You're a Jewet. Don't say that to them. <laughs> right? As far as I know, that'd be wrong. Um, but, but, but we say that. Don't forget who you are. You're a Jewet. Jewets don't quit. Don't forget this. But sometimes we want to quit, don't we? Doesn't matter if your last name is Jewet or not. Sometimes you want to quit. Have you ever been there? Let me share a very personal story. I prayed a lot about sharing this story because it's so very recent. A moment, you know how life brings you to those moments when you want to just throw up your hands and walk away? For me, that moment was 2020. Very recent. I've shared this story in bits and pieces in private conversations, but never publicly. So bear with me a moment. Listen to it all the way through. You see, for me, 2020, the year 2020 started in 2019, November of 2019. I was, uh, I, I had a heart surgery, another heart surgery. I think it was my first one being here. Um, and so far, my only one. Hey, that's good. That, because my track record had been a heart surgery almost about every 16 or 18 months up to that point. So we prepared, and it was, it was supposed to be a simple procedure, and, and all things said and done, it was. Um, but recovery was not what I had expected. Right? I don't know if it was age. I'm getting a little older. I've had a lot of surgeries. And maybe my body just doesn't bounce back the way that it used to. I don't know. I don't know. But recovery was not what I thought it should be. And, and Advent and Christmas came and went. And it was hard. It was hard. Christmas that year was hard. Still, the Sundays rolled and did, did what needed done. And come January, some kind of infection settled in. January of 2020... Now, don't jump to conclusions because at this point, COVID was not a thing, right? It hadn't yet really done what it was going to do. So I remember going from the ER here in Derby by ambulance to the hospital in Wichita. And I stayed there two or three days while they tried to figure out what this infection was, coughing up blood. It was miserable. And they took blood. They took enough blood that uh, none of them should have, been, uh, should have been sleeping at night. They were like vampires. They took so much blood and no one could figure it out until a phenomenal internist, a hospitalist, came and began to put all of the pieces together. We got a phone call later after my dismissal. It was a slow-growing lymphoma. We found it. All I heard was, you have cancer. And not too many years earlier, lymphoma had killed my grandfather. So, ho, oh, surprise. But don't worry, he said, it's slow growing. There's nothing to panic about. In fact, we'd like to put you in this clinical trial with a new drug. It's like chemo. You don't lose your hair, and, and, and the effects are a bit different, but we'd like to put you in this trial. And so I went in this trial. And while I didn't lose my hair, what, I, what did happen was my body hurt all of the time from the inside out. And if you've never been through that kind of treatment, a, a, a treatment that is dealing with bone marrow, right, and, and systemic things in your body, it's hard to describe the pain. It wasn't stabbing, it wasn't sharp, it wasn't localized, it was there constantly, all the time. It was exhausting. I was exhausted all of the time. I drank Red Bull like medicine <laughs> just to keep going three or four a day. It was exhausting. 
And then COVID hit. My trial was disbanded, defunded because of COVID. So I was left on my own. And then as a church, we started having to make decisions. We had a board that met constantly and regularly and made decisions. But you know, if you were part of this, you know that there were no right decisions during COVID. You know that? There was no, no right decision. If we hung up signs, we shouldn't be hanging up signs for people to have to wear masks. If we close the doors, we should have faith over fear. We shouldn't close our doors. If we put out masks, I'm not wearing a mask. If we put out hand sanitizer, well, you've been watching the news. You shouldn't watch the news. Don't trust those people. Every decision was the wrong decision. People left the church. Some angry. Others stopped coming and just never returned. Well, pastor, it's not personal. Everything hurt. Everything hurt. My body hurt. My spirit hurt. And in the midst of this, if you recall, we were in the middle of a debacle with the roof where tens of thousands of dollars were bleeding out because of a bad contractor and a bad contract. In income was declining. Lawyer bills were increasing. We had already invested $75,000. We were stuck. It affected my congregation. Even what you didn't know affected you because it affected me. It affected the job. It was not fun coming to work for anybody, even those that worked with me. It affected my family. It affected my marriage. And in the middle of it, after a series of confrontations, I wrote letters. I wrote a letter to my DS. I said, I'm done. Not done with the church. I'm done with ministry. I'm out. I'm out. I wrote a letter to the board that I carried with me into board meetings. Of course, board meetings were all remote at that point. But there it was, to let them know, to give my 30 days as the, the bylaws dictate. And every Sunday morning, whether it be on the camera or in person, on my tablet, was a note ready to read to the congregation. I was done. You ever been there? Where's your faith in the midst of this? What does faith look like in the midst of this? What is faith itself? You see, this is who Hebrews is written to, for people who are done. Maybe that's where you find yourself today. If not today, someday. Or maybe you remember that journey yourself. I'm just done. I'm just done. Hebrews is written for people like me, for people like you. Thankfully, I was surrounded by people who were sane in the midst of my insanity. <laughs> people who reminded me of my call. People who reminded me that you can be like Jonah and run from God, but you'll never hide. I had sane people in the midst of my insanity. But here's who Hebrews is written to. You see, the question that begs being answered in moments like these is the question of faith. Where is your faith in this? Well, Jeff, didn't you have faith? Well, I did, and I do. I had faith in God, but I wasn't sure what I, what I was believing God would do or accomplish. I didn't know what it even meant to have faith. You see, it is faith, though, that keeps us going during those difficult times. But again, the question is, what is faith? Is faith just believing something? Is faith just a feeling? I didn't really have the belief. I believed in God. I wasn't walking away from what I believed. 
So is that what faith is? Is it a feeling? I had no feelings except anger, hurt, pain, pain. Through and through, physically, emotionally, it hurt. Uh, what is faith in the midst of this? How, Hebrews helps answer that question for us. We read it earlier. Notice what he says. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. The conviction or the confidence of things not seen. I like the way that the kingdom translation of the Bible puts it. It begins with the question, what then is faith? It is what gives assurance to our hopes. It is what gives us conviction about things that we cannot see. You see, faith is not just blind acceptance of, of the impossible against all reason. Oh, Christians, we've got to stop talking about faith like it ignores what is common sense. We've got to stop talking about faith um, as, if, as if faith is the opposite of science or sound judgment, or rational thinking. Faith is not the opposite of that. Faith actually grows in the midst of that. It's not faith in the impossible. It's faith in the probable. This is what hope is. Faith is taking the next step because the one who is calling can be trusted. Faith is not a feeling. It is the action of walking in faithfulness. I want you to think about faith and faithfulness as synonyms, even though we don't treat them this way. Faith is faithfulness. Faithfulness is the action of being faithful. <laughs> so when scripture talks about faith, it's talking about faithfulness, what we do. Faith is what we do. Faith is what we do. Think about it for those of you that have stood in front of a congregation and maybe with an officiant, a pastor, and have ex exchanged vows with your fiancé, soon-to-be spouse. Usually there is a pledge, do you take this woman, do you take this man? Then there is the exchange of vows. I, Jeff, take you, Dana, to be my wedded wife, to have and to hold from this day forward in sickness and in health for richer or for poorer, and for better or for worse, until death we do part. 2020, I thought, was the, was the moment I was going to fulfill my vows to the end. Faith. But then after those vows, there comes an exchange of rings. Have you been through this? Um, I, I'm on like my 15th ring. I lose rings because I'm not good at keeping them on and I won't try to take this off because I will lose it by the end of the service. Now I just get my wedding bands on Amazon by bulk. <laughs> I'm just bad about it. So this is a nothing ring. It's not the ring that was given to me um, 22 years ago. Um, it, it's a very different ring. That ring is long gone. <laughs> Who knows? Um, but I remember that exchange. Here's, what, here's how it goes. Something like this. You hand the ring to the other or you put it on their finger. With this ring, I thee wed as a pledge of my love and as, a, as, as the evidence of my constant faithfulness, my fidelity, my faithfulness. Do you hear that? What does faith mean? I'm saying I have faith in them and they have faith in me. Dana has faith in me. I have faith in Dana. But the reason for that is because we are faithful to each other. What we do. It's what we do. Faithful. Does that mean you always feel faithful? No. Marriage is hard. I don't always feel like it. I don't always feel like I have faith in her, and I know she doesn't always feel like she has faith in me because I am a loose cannon. <laughs> Right, but, but, but still, in the midst of that, there is faithfulness that is shared between us. You see, this is what Hebrews is talking about, or, or maybe in recalling the story I told at the beginning of the sermon. Uh, it's the story of that tightrope walker. Faith is the action of getting in the wheelbarrow because the one who is pushing it has proven that he can be trusted. This is what faith is. Faith is faithfulness. The reminder that the author of Hebrews gives us is that faith, excuse me, faith and hope go together. Thus, when hope is lost, faith is lost. But where hope persists, 
faith persists. And, and hope is not some kind of flight of fancy, cross your fingers, wishful thinking, lay, luck be a lady tonight kind of uh, rationale. That's not what hope is. Hope is the possible coming into focus. Think of it like mountain climbers. Um, I, I, my analogy is always Pikes Peak. It's a mountain I know well in Colorado Springs. And the last few miles of Pikes Peak are called the 13 Golden Stairs. What a lie. <laughs> it's a lie. They are 13 switchbacks. And they're all above timberline. And every switchback hurts, hurts, hurts. Your legs are burning. Your thighs are quivering from the constant climb up. Your lungs are burning. And, and here's what hope does. Hope looks up the mountain and sees others who are further on the journey or sees the ones who have summited and, and sees that. It's hope. It, it's coming into focus and sees that and says, okay, I can do it. One more step. I can make it. One more step. That's all it does. This is what hope is. Hope is the possible coming into focus. It is looking up that mountain and seeing. Hope is knowing that you can make it, not because you have made it, but because other people have done it before you. Faith, then, is the action of taking the next step. Hope is the possible coming into focus. Faith is the action of taking the next step. Um, I, I hope this releases some of your anxieties because I, I'm like you. I have trouble sometimes having faith if it's just something that I'm supposed to feel. But if it's something I can do, I can do something. <laughs> I can take one more step. Even if I don't uh, feel it at the time. Maybe even if I'm having troubles believing it at the time, I can take one more step. This is what faith is. Faith is the action of taking the next step, step by step, inch by inch. Hope sees what is possible, and faith steps into that reality. Or as Tony Evans, I heard say recently, says, <clears throat> excuse me, Tony Evans says, faith is a lifestyle not an event. Ah, it's a lifestyle. It's an action. It's what we do. This is the value of the stories of reading that we read in Hebrews 11. By faith. Every one of those stories begins with the phrase, by faith, by faith. What is the faith that compelled them? It was the action of the next step. By faith, Abraham left his homeland by faith, Moses. By faith, the Hebrew children. Or maybe in my home, by faith, Ron Jewett. That's my dad. It was 1986. I was <laughs> 10 or 11 years old. Uh, some of you are like, wow, he's young. Others of you are like, wow, he's old. <laughs> the rest of you are in the same misery as me. But uh, it was 1986, I was about 10 years old. Uh, there were, my parents have five children, five of us, but only four of us were there at the time. My younger brother is many years removed, and so he was not yet in the picture. And, uh, and my, we lived in a small town where my, my grandparents lived, my dad's siblings lived, my mom's family lived, our whole family was there. They had always been there. We had our little farm uh, my dad was in pest control, and we had a few head of cattle, some chickens, just enough, and a big old garden, just enough to keep us going all year long. And we had a lot of security, a lot of safety, until my dad said, God is calling me at 38 years old, God is calling me to ministry. What does that mean? Well, it means we need to move to Colorado Springs so I can go to college at 38 years old with four kids, move a thousand miles away, away from everybody and everything. We packed up the truck by faith. We drove the thousand miles by faith. We rolled into Colorado Springs. My dad didn't have a house for us to stay in that night. It was three in the afternoon and we stopped by the school where he would be attending 
And, and, and the registrar at the time said, hey, I've got a lead on a house if you call this number. We called the number and we were in a rental uh, two hours later by faith, right? All he had to do was take the next step. It was a big step, but he had to take that next step. And then by faith, no job, no job, right? He got a job popping popcorn for $4.25 at Vic's Popcorn while trying to figure out how to take care of a family of six with the seventh on the way, right? By faith. Faith is the action. See, this is the point of what's going on. And why do we tell these stories by faith? It's to remind us that they have done it. But here's what's amazing. Here's what happens in this passage. Something remarkable happens in Hebrews chapter 12 with verse 1. It's almost like those that have finished the race have gone through the tape, right? They have finished the race. And this is the, what the, the writer of Hebrews is painting a picture of. It's a race, not a sprint, It's a marathon, and not the kind of run where you're competing with the person next to you. The run itself, the marathon you're on, is is a race to learn how to run well and to finish well. That's what this race is about. This is what he's talking about, and it's not a sprint. He says it's a marathon, but here's what's happened. There's those that have gone before by faith, Moses, Abraham, whomever, even by faith, Ron Jewett, though he's not dead, Right? But by faith, these people have gone before. In a sense, they have finished the race. And as they broke the line of that finish, as they broke the tape, they come around, and there they are. The ones that have just run, they're on the sidelines. Or maybe up in the bleachers. Since therefore we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses as these, it says. All of the people he've mentioned are already dead. But we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses as these. Can I offer an opinion at this point about this passage? Because I think what we need to do to run a race of endurance is to have a cheering section. Can I tell you, you've got a cheering section, and here's my opinion on this passage and others that I piece together through Scripture. I think those that dwell in the presence of Jesus right now are cheering us on. I don't think that they are so far removed from this world that they don't see the race that we're winning. Some of you are like, yeah, but it says all of their tears will be dried. There'll be no more, right? no more suffering, no more weeping, all of that. Yeah, that's fine, except if you read that in Revelation 21, that comes after, after Christ's return after the resurrection of the dead, after the new heavens and the new earth are established. In fact, earlier in that same book, we find martyrs underneath the throne crying out to God, saying, how long, O Lord, will you let this continue to happen? They're seeing something. Here's my opinion. I think our departed, who are in the presence of Christ, are still cheering us on. I think they're a part of our life. I'm not saying they, they do things. They're not God. They're not angels, but I think they're there. They're cheering us on. You can do it. You can do it. Remember, I did it. I made it. You can do it. Keep going. You can do it. But I also think we need a cheering section that we can see and touch and hold as well. It's what the church is. Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses as these, what do we need to run a race that endures, run a race of perseverance? Here's the first thing. We need a cheering section. We do. Now, I'm not good at this. I don't like congratulating people for things that I expect them to do. Like, my kids never make their beds. Never. Honestly, they've probably followed mom and dad in some of that. So we don't make too much of a deal out of it. But let's say, hypothetically, one of my kids came out and they're like, Dad, I made my bed. I wouldn't congratulate them. You know why? It's your job. Dad, I did my chores. Yeah, so did I. (laughs) Right? Well, 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 you know, what what do you want from me? Well, uh, congratulations. No, I give you a house to live in. You're welcome right? I, I, I'm not good at this, but we need people in our life who are going to encourage us, spur us on. Sometimes, like I needed in 2020, sometimes it's a swift kick in the pants. 
We need it. We need it, a cheering section. This is part of what we call discipleship. It's the people around us who, who have seen a larger picture than what we have seen, who understand what, what the goal of faith looks like. They're to say, yes, you can do it. Hey, here, let me come alongside you. Let me pray for you. Let me encourage you. We need a cheering section to run a, a race by faith. Here's the second thing we need if we're going to run a race by faith. We need some good training. Here in our passage, here's what it says. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses as these, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Ah, get rid of the excess baggage. This is part of training. Notice it says, get rid of weight and sin which clings so close. Did you know you can encumber encumber your life with weights that are not sinful that will still hinder you from running the race? I hear this often as a pastor. Well, pastor, do you think this is a sin? Is this a sin? Right? Like teenagers, we want to know how far is too far. Not so we know what we shouldn't do, but so we know how close we can get to not doing what we shouldn't do, right? And we live our lives the same way. Well, is this sin? Do you think this is sin? Do you think this is sin? Do you remember what Paul said? Paul said all things are, 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 are permitted, but not all things are beneficial, right? I think sometimes the better question is not, is it sin, but is it helpful? Is it helpful to run the race? There are things in our life, there are weights, some of them are sin. But if we ask the question, is this helping me run the race? We'll get rid of sin. And we'll get rid of those things that are actually hindering me as well. Get rid of these things. I love what Jonathan Edwards has said, and you've heard me say it many times, but he comments, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. Get rid of the weight that so easily encumbers and so much of the weight that we carries is what happened earlier on the track (laughs) behind us. Well, we were all in our lanes and he tripped me up. Well, that's the past. Well, he knocked down that hurdle. Well, that's the past. Well, this happened, that happened. Yep, that's the past. Well, I fell and skinned my knee. Yeah, that's the past. Or uh, so much of the weight that we carry is on the track behind us. And it's not that we forget. It's that we press on for the goal, which is our upward calling in Christ Jesus. We press on in spite of it. So we need training in this regard. We need to get rid of the weight, things that will slow us down. So we need a cheering section. We need a training session. And the finally, thing, the, finally, the last thing is, is we need a goal. You ever work for something you don't know what you're working for? We need a goal. And here's what this passage tells us, is that Jesus is actually the starting pistol and the tape at the end of the race. Listen to what it says, looking to Jesus, who is the founder and the perfecter of our faith. He he compels us in faith to begin, and he is the object to which we are running towards. And, And how do we know we can trust him? Because ultimately, that's what faith is, isn't it? It's trust. How do we know we can trust him? Well, like Charles Blondin. On the tightrope, he's made the journey. He's already done it. We've seen it. We've heard about it. We've witnessed it. His track record is a thousand. He's batting a thousand if we are to mix metaphors. Right? This is, this is what we have in Christ. He begins, he is our beginning point, and he is our ending point. And sometimes we forget that the goal of faith is not heaven by itself. It's God himself. The reward of faith is God. (laughs) He is the author and the perfecter of our faith. He's the beginning and the end. He's what we're running. He's why we're running and he's what we're running towards. And as the weight drops off, as the sin falls away, what we find is the person that we remember we are becoming is that Christ-like person that's been there by God's grace is now appearing in our life. By faith, by faith. So here's the question today. Where is faith operating in your life? How are you running the race? What's slowing you down? What's holding you up? 
Maybe you're like me a couple of years ago and you're done. You're done. Hear the, hear the, the tone and the, the tenor of Scripture today. God, through his writer, is calling you to keep going. I want you to imagine today all of those people who have preceded you on this race. Do you know they're cheering for you now? I believe it with all my heart. And maybe they're even praying for you. You're like, well, we don't pray to the saints. I'm not saying that. But these people who prayed for you on earth because they loved you, now they're standing in the very presence of Jesus. Do you think they stopped talking to Jesus about you? Ha, I don't think so. That's prayer, isn't it? They're encouraging, they're praying, they're cheering you on. But so, this is what the church is for too. We're here, we want to run this race with you, so you need your cheering section. And you need training, you need to let some things go. It's time. And you, you need to know what you're running towards, it's Jesus. So here's the question for us today, is how are you running the race? What does your life of faith look like? Here's the goal, is that it looks like the cross. Notice what it says. It says in our passage that Jesus, for the joy set before him, did not forsake the cross or the shame that came with it. For the joy set before him. You're like, you know what, Pastor? Right now everything stinks. Right now it's cancer and it's COVID and it's, it's bills and it's work and it's marriage and it's kids and it stinks and the car's broken and the dog has run away and, and, and the food is burnt and the channels on my TV aren't working and life stinks. Now that sounds silly, but sometimes we get there. And you don't know what the next step is. Here's what it is. It's God coming alongside and saying, get up, get up, you can keep doing this. And all of the people around saying, one more step, one more lap, one more go at it, let's do this, you can do it. And it looks like a cross because we know there is joy in front of us. Uh, this, is, this is what scripture says, is though he, uh, he, he did not reject the cross, he was able to endure it because of the joy set before him. I'm reminded of that psalm, Psalm 23. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Right? The valley of the shadow of death. But notice what happens after the valley of the shadow of death. It says, I have, you have prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies, and now surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You see how that works? There's joy on the other side. And that joy is what compels us to keep running in faith. Oh, it hurts. It hurts. But hear this as a cheer. We're cheering you on, and others are too. Hear this as a rejoinder, a reminder that you, you're trying to run with too much weight. to get rid of it. Hear this this morning as a reminder that the goal of our faith is Jesus Christ. And so with this meal comes nourishment for the race itself. Paul says every time you eat this and drink this, you proclaim the Lord's death past until he comes, future. He is the author and the perfecter of our faith. You see how this works? The beginning and the end. The cross is where we are born. Heaven is where we are remade. The race is where we become more and more the image of Christ. And so today, the invitation is to run the race in faith.